The Urban and the Mystic is here to help you gift with intention. We've been featured on Oprah's favorite things list, in Vogue, Goop, House Beautiful, Forbes, and not to brag, but we're even my mom's favorite gifting company. We have gifts that help you show how much you care, to truly celebrate someone, and to even help someone heal. From the love bowl to the bereavement box, there is a gift for all of life's occasions. They're handmade, hand-packed, and even the gift notes are handwritten. Order the perfect gift today at theurbanandthemystic.com. Welcome to Ask Dr. Louise. Keep falling up. Are you navigating the dilemmas that addiction, aging, and mental health issues present? Ask Dr. Louise is the place to start. Life is often a series of hiccups, and while you might get knocked down, you always have the opportunity to fall up. Addictions and mental health issues are not a life sentence. There's always hope and strategic solutions for helping you become a better version of yourself while impacting your loved ones with grace, compassion, and integrity. Join us as we navigate how to have those uncomfortable yet necessary conversations with yourself and your loved ones to take the actions needed to help you rise to be your best possible selves. Get ready to walk away with doable solutions. Ask Dr. Louise starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so honored and so excited to have Christy Cashman with me today. Those of you that don't know her, you're going to want to know her because she is just truly an amazing, heroic woman. She is a best-selling author and she just won an award for the truth about horses. It's right here and I'll be talking about it with her. She is a, and this, oh, by the way, this book is going to be turned into a made-for-TV series with Jane Seymour if I, and Christy. And also, she is a great philanthropist. She founded an amazing, amazing philanthropy called You Think, Inc., which I'm going to let you tell her about. But for, And she, right now, she's in Boston, a little warm, so we're going to stop right now and welcome Christy. What an honor to have you. Let the audience tell you. Why don't you tell our listenership about yourself? Oh, thank you, Dr. Louise. And I am honored to be on here with you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, so I am a mother of uh, two boys. I am uh, an author now, which is my newest title, I guess. And, um, and I also have started uh, You Think, which is a mentorship program for teens from 13 to 18 who are interested in the arts and might not ordinarily be able to experience a, a workshop for a weekend. And I do those uh, workshops every, really every three months or so, both in Ireland and then annually in Boston now. So um, it's kind of to me a way to give back because I realized how important my mentors were in my writing process and how mm -hmm. there were two people who really stood out for me, Betsy Horst and Arthur Vanderbilt and their words and their encouragement and their excitement about reading some early drafts are really the things that I needed, the foothold that I needed to keep going. And sometimes that's all you need is just somebody to tell you, you know, keep going, what you're doing is good. And it's not like there aren't gonna be pitfalls and difficult times after that, but words from people you know and respect are really important in the process, in the creative process, or maybe any process that you do, you know, to, to help you grow. Well, I, if I remember correctly, you grew up in a very large family. Was it one yeah. of 10 or 11? And yeah. I'm certainly, sure that that taught you some resilience and I, I so agree that you need to have a mentor I had many mentors in my lifetime and so to help me achieve or be the person I want and but also I had a mentor and I'm going to switch to the book who really helped me through the grieving process as you might know I was a young girl age seven when my father died and I, if it wasn't for a man named Leon Rubenstein, who actually was a camp owner, someone luckily enough sent me away to camp after my father died by suicide. I've, and he mentored me throughout my life um, in many ways, at least till I was about 16. 
but it's those mentors and what I'm so drawn to and just absolutely find your book, The Truth About Horses, Everybody Needs to Read It. And Spellbind is how you deal with grief and loss and transformation. So could you share the listenership a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, I think I just tried to make Reese a relatable character because it's not a, you know, grieving is so different for everyone. And I think she experienced anger because her father wasn't connected to her in the way that she needed him to be after her mother dies. And I think that her anger made her really act out in some really negative ways, but that's all she really knew how to do. You know, I think that, I think that if she felt connected with her father, if her father kind of came to her and, and asked her how she was doing instead of avoiding emotions at the time, that's probably what she needed, but instead he just sent her to therapists and, and, and did his own thing and just sort of thought, if I can, if I can just, you know, get this family back together, if I can date the right woman and then, you know, kind of start over again, he was thinking very, you know, superficially, not, not necessarily, uh, from a place of, of, of healing the heart, you know, um, but almost I think the father had the idea that if he could make the world look right from the outside, then it could work itself out on the inside. But, you know, I think that's silly when we really think about it because you have to start from the inside. Well, I think that you were brilliant in this because I have, you know, as a clinician and everything, I've done a lot with grief and loss, including working with the widows of 9-11. But as a young child, I could relate to Reese and mm. what I once coined, I guess, um, was non-intentional. You And you capture it with beauty and with words. Thank you. The non-intentional emotional unavailability when someone dies and nobody knows what to do and nobody knows what to say and mm. everybody wants it sort of be, but, but grief as you so beautifully portray is differential. So dad does something totally different. And he was, in my words, not intentionally, emotionally unavailable to her. And Reese, talk about the special relationship that Reese found, which helped her on the path. Because I think what you capture also is probably what you do and you think the power of a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking about a relationship with Wes? Yes. Yeah. So Wes is a selective mute because of, something very traumatic that happened in his life. He chooses not to speak. And I had fun writing that because um, it was an opportunity for Reese to listen to herself and, and listen to her sound um, in a way absurd to herself, you know? And she, then she could see herself more clearly when Wes wasn't responding because I think that her her fight or flight instincts were so strong and she was more of a fighter that anybody who said anything to her, including the therapists and the teachers and everybody, she wanted to fight, you know, and or, or, or flee. Mm -hmm. But um, Wes was somebody who, since he didn't speak, she could sit and talk, you know, till the cows came home but that was the best therapy for her, you know, just having somebody who was there and almost imagining what he was thinking, even though he might not have been thinking it, you know, she's, she's one of those, um, my favorite characters are you know, unreliable narrators where you understand that there were the way they see the world, but the way they see the world isn't necessarily how the world is. <laughs> and I think that's Reese. But we get it because of her age, because of her trauma, because of her passion. She wants to, re, you know, all she's interested in is kind of getting back the place that made her feel safe, which is the big green barn. Find a horse that, that went to, you know, wherever, we don't know. And, and that's all she wants to do. And in some ways, that's her addiction, right? The horses are her addiction. And it's her place that she can go to um escape 
some of her pain, but also be reminded and feel that and feel close to her mother. You know, there's a line in the book that talks about her saying, she says, my, my dead mother is more help to me than my father who's right in the next room, you know, and that's because she remembers things that her mother tells her that are wise. She, she, she remembers how her mother would respond to a sick horse or a scared horse or a, you know, um, a certain situation. And, and that is what she kind of relied on to get through and navigate her new world without her mother. Where did you get the inspiration from this? Did you, I, you grew up, I know you like to ride. Did you grow up with horses? Did you have yeah. anything like this? Or how did you come up with this? Because it's brilliant and it's no. beautiful. No. no, it is. I mean, as a clinician looking in on it, you you treat grief and loss with dignity. Um, a, a child being angry at, at the remaining parent is so, so true and not being able to find their way and having conversations. I mean, all of that is is yeah. extremely well done. Thank you. And and that's a good point. I think that, that Reese could have been angry with her father, even if he did all the right things. That's you right. Know? Even if he was there for her. So, so he, I don't want him to be such a bad guy. Some of the people who read the book say, oh, he's such an idiot, he's so, so terrible. He's just an injured human being, you know, who didn't know how to get through life without his his wife. His wife was the the person who was, you know, the one who held things together. And he was probably so never imagined that who does imagine that you'll lose the person you love the most. And I think he was so devastated by it. He just had to, you know, find an addiction, which in his case, he's kind of sleeping around town oh, that's right <laughs> and find something to take it's really taking his mind off of his feelings right isn't that what addiction is yeah it's and, really taking the pain away and yeah and you know, loss I mean um I, you know I, I actually I did a lot of research on women and men that were widowed at a young age just like him and you know uh, men, if they choose to remarry they do it in less than they do it in eight months 1.2 years and yeah. women, if they're widowed, will do 2.9. And so he was really, you know, you're, you're, he's following a pattern. And I think that as a person or a human, he did the best he could with the resources he could because he yeah. was really harmed. And But for a child who loses a parent, it becomes really hard. What do I do? What do you do? And also, I feel really, really different, really mm -hmm. awkward. Um, I'm not the same as other people. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guess on a personal level, I, I related so well because my father died when I was yeah. seven. And so this, this, and that's where I didn't know how you came across is how you actually mm -hmm. captured the mm -hmm. such great feelings about. Yeah, that. definitely. After my mom died, I was 17 and, and that it just automatically sets you apart from all mm -hmm. your other peers. It's that, it's that. Th that thing that sort of stunts your growth and makes you grow all at the same time, you know, makes you see the world totally differently. All of a sudden your world's upside down, like, uh, you know, that's just how it feels. And you can't relate to anyone. And, um, and, and going to school felt very robotic to me going about anything felt robotic unless I was with my horse, I think, unless I was, um, you know, riding or able to spend time with him. He gave my life purpose. You know, he really did. Um, he was born when I was nine. My mom died when I was 17. So imagine those two oh, yes. very different, you know, the, the most beautiful thing in my life at the time, the birth of my baby horse who, you know, mm -hmm. what girl doesn't fall in love? Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and absolutely the, the very worst thing not that long after so um but you know what was my biggest inspiration the actual story the like the day-to-day -day, the telling of the story you know that a story is just a story if you think about it something mm -hmm. you know you have to establish a world and characters and make something horrible happen and then 
make them do stupid things and learn something, hopefully, right? That's, yeah. the, that's the epitome of a story. But to me, it elevates it when you add a spiritual or magical realism element. And to me, that was my inspiration for the book was bringing in the spiritual, magical realism element that just made it something that wasn't a regular old story, but something that had a um, something inexplicable about it and something that each reader could take differently or uh, learn something differently. My favorite line in the book is you will see. Mm. And, and whether and we like it or not, it's true. We will see, you know, you will see what uh, the outcome of our work is or the outcome of something maybe some mistakes that we've made those are uh, life has a way of showing us <laughs> right yes, it does. you know <laughs> I, I want the listenership to know and so you're making I can't wait to see this I mean I love reading because it allows me to design the characters with your word yeah. that I yeah. get to affect what they look like what they talk like but you're actually going to be bringing this to the screen and when will that be happening well, we have to wait for a script, which is I had to take a break to do this from writing my script. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I wanted that you did that. But it's um, it it you never know. I mean, Jane has so many great contacts. We've had some really interesting meetings with some pro uh, producers that are very interested. It's just a matter of taking the time and getting the script done and getting a, a good script done because it's. It's a visual story. I think most people agree when they read it, they say, oh, I can see it. You know, I can see it on the screen. And I think that's probably because of the experience I had in the film world where I read a lot of scripts. I worked on scripts. I was in some movies and that kind of thing. So that is my, you know, um, that was one of my stronger uh, abilities as an author is to be able to write very visually. And, um, and so it's a natural thing. Now, the voiceover is really strong in the book as well. So I'm having fun in the screenwriting process, choosing where Reese is speaking or where maybe she's, she's you know, talking into her phone because she's, uh, she's translating to, the, to her podcast or her um, whatever it is she's using, mm -hmm. Snapchat or whatever, how she's gonna get her horse back and her barn back. So I'm having fun being thinking creatively on how to use her voiceover. Well, that's beautiful. I want everyone to, well, first of all, if you call in, I have two copies that I'm happy <laughs> to give away and send, but I want everybody to read the truth about horses, but I want to change a little bit. And also Chrissy is very um, humble. She also writes children's books. Um, and I, and I, I love the, was a Beula, the cat. I mean, you have great <laughs> titles. They're so wonderful for children's books, but I don't want us to run out of time. And so if you can tell us a little bit about the other books you're writing, but can you speak to us about, you think I'm obviously, I love mentorship. I mm. love being able to change the trajectory of young people's lives through exposure to things that they don't always do. So maybe you could, in the time remaining, just talk right. about those two things. Sure, so the other books that I'm writing, I've written two children's books and a third that is that I'm still working on, but it's uh, Petrie's uh, Next Things and um, The Not So Average Monkey of Kilkee Castle. And uh, those are both based on the property uh, the property that we have in Ireland and a monkey that actually used to live in the castle. But I totally, you know, fictionalized the whole story, made him this little monkey who thinks he should be king. And so he bosses around all of his friends, the cat, the dog, the pigeon, the fish, and makes the rules. And then all of a sudden finds out that he's alone. And, <laughs> and, um, and so he says, well, maybe I shouldn't, you know, try to be king. Maybe I should just be the average old monkey that I am. And so, <laughs> which makes him much happier. So I guess that's a lesson on maybe bullying or something like that. Um, um, but it's cute. I enjoyed writing it. And, and the other one is about him, about Petrie choosing to be in the moment as opposed to always be 
looking at his next thing that he has to do. Petrie's next things are about all those things out there that we think about doing that take us out of the moment of where we are now, you know, and, and we're, I mean, I do it all the time. I, I'm in a meeting and I'm thinking about what I have to do after the meeting and it really takes me out. So I'm working on that. I'm working on even when, the, when it's hard and dealing with difficult relationships that that's what I'm dealing with. And, and rather than avoid it, like Reese's dad does in the truth about horses, I'm trying to just see what is, what is life trying to tell me by engaging with it, you know, and, and feeling the feelings maybe that, that as I was growing up and, and didn't have time to feel with the passing of my mother, maybe it's, maybe life gives us opportunities to feel all over again so that we can heal, you know? I, I, I yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Being 100% present in the mm -hmm. moment is hard work. Hard work. 100% present yeah. allows us the opportunity to really see things and to feel and to really become the best version of ourselves, I think. Yeah. And so I applaud yeah. you for that. And um, I love the fact that there's a, I'm going to go, I haven't read that one, but I'm going to go buy it today. And I oh, encourage I'll send don't buy it. I, I really encourage the listenership <laughs> to do it. Also, um, you know, as a university professor, I had two major grants, but they were on peer mentoring. One was called student to student, and it was less for people who were less fortunate. They had been, and that's why I started with people who had been in and out of prison, but it was really to transform them and mm -hmm. to give them different types of experiences. And so I always am so grateful on a personal level from the camp owner, camp counselor, Mr. Rubenstein, mm -hmm. who pretty well saved my life yeah. and allowed me wow. to play with popsicle sticks. Oh, yeah. I did shoot horses. I wasn't so good, but I <laughs> did shoot a bow and arrow so oh, well that it stayed in my brain. And <laughs> two years ago, I was in Bhutan and I hit a bullseye, not having to shoot an a bow and arrow. Amazing. I was 11 years old. It, it was amazing. But That's it was such a gratifying feeling, isn't it? Yeah. And so <laughs> I wonder if you could teach us a little bit about Youth Inc. And yeah. so I know you have an adult retreat as well. Yes. Yeah. So you think um, I started about two and a half years ago. And because we own the property in Ireland, it was easy for me to do it there because it was an, a venue that I had control over. So we could use the, you know, the different rooms. If there was a wedding there, for instance, we would just move into another, you know, kind of out of the way, but there's, it's a big property. So we were able to use it. The, the restaurants are there. So we had the food, everything was right there at my fingertips for, for putting on a retreat like this. And it's usually a Friday to a Sunday, um, especially during the school year. And the kids would come on a, on a Friday. That would be sort of the beginning of Friday afternoon after school. We would work in into the night, whether it was building puppets to do a puppet, you know, big, huge puppet show, whether it was an art exhibit, we've done podcasts, we've made movies. Mm -hmm. And we're just, like you said, just trying to expose them to as many things as they, as we can and see what clicks, see what inspires them. You know, so much about, of, of, um, wanting to be creative is finding where your voice is best heard as an artist. You know, um, my voice, uh, I feel as an, as a, as an author has been a much stronger voice than as an actor, for instance, you know, um, I'm, I find it much more fulfilling to write than to act. Um, you know, maybe I just haven't had the right part yet. I don't know, but it hasn't, writing for me has been my thing and I'm open to other things, but writing right now is, is where it's at for me. And I want to offer kids that same opportunity to find their voice as a creative person, because I just makes, I just think it makes you stronger in life, no matter what you do. And that was really important to me because like I said, of Art and Betsy, who were so um, helpful to me with my process, reading early, early drafts and and giving me feedback and telling me to keep going. That's what I wanted to create for these kids. And so what I did is that I then also created a retreat for adults and the adults get to experience some of the same things the kids do, 
about a lot about uh, mindfulness and meditation, but mm-hmm. incorporating things like pottery and and horseback riding, things that you might not have tried or maybe haven't done in a long time because we're all busy with our families and our jobs and everything. So it's this retreat, this getaway where you really can try something new. Now that's something that people pay for, but that also is what pays for the kids when they do their retreat, or that's how I'm beginning to set it up. We only had our first adult retreat in Ireland uh, last March. Well, I'm really excited because I'm all in and am ready to sign up for the adult retreat. But most of all, I love what I all, I'll really love what you're doing for children and for youth and for inspiring everybody. And Christy, tell people how they can learn more about you think. And I can tell them all they must go buy the truth about horses. And, you. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart. Keep doing what you're doing, keep exploring, keep growing, and keep giving your voice to the world because you do inspire change. And I'm very grateful for that. Dr. Louise, thank you. I can't thank you enough. That is, I'll be thinking about that all day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so and I- you can find out about pretty much everything I'm doing from my website, um, Christy, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y, Cashman, C-A-S-H-M-A-N.com. Um, my book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that, but go to your local bookstore and ask them for it because I really think it's important to go to the local bookstores. They might not have it on the shelf there, but they can order it for you. And I really think it's important to do that. Um, if you go to a, you know, a bookstore in your neighborhood support them and because they all need support and and be sure and follow christy on instagram because she has the best things about books like on any mm-hmm. given day you're going to find her checking out a library or speaking at a library speaking at a bookstore or I, I don't know you know those wonderful stands where you can put books and share them with other people because that's a really a wonderful way to enrich um, everybody's life and yours. So thank you for um, speaking to us on that very warm Boston day. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm sweating here. <laughs> I know. And I'm from Southern California and I look like it's going to snow. <laughs> well, I hope I get to have you on again. And I'm Any, anytime. Just- I really enjoyed it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Um, And I hope to all of you listeners out here that you'll take time and share with your friends and your neighbors. And be sure if you have questions to write in. And I know Christy's always available to answer questions. And so am I, because the whole goal is for everyone to keep falling up and to keep inspiring change. And no matter what the hiccups are in life, I I do believe, um, not in a Pollyannish way, but there's a way in which we can grow, change, give to others, and be of service. So thank you so much today for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, take care, I think. You have been listening to Ask Dr. Louise. Keep falling up. Tune in every fourth Wednesday at 1230 Pacific Time on Transformation Network for more fresh takes on addiction and mental health that help you and your loved ones to keep falling up. We navigate how to ask yourself tough questions and how to have those uncomfortable yet necessary conversations with your loved ones. Ask Dr. Louise helps you gain resources to take doable actions. For more on the most advanced health and wellness solutions, visit allaboutinterventions.com. The Urban and the Mystic is a brand for lovers. Lovers of life, lovers of connection, lovers of love. We help you gift someone a feeling that lasts long after the first unboxing, and that is the real gift. Our line of offerings are chic, thoughtful, personalized, and there is something for everyone. This is modern gifting. Now go find your perfect gift at theurbanandthemystic.com today. No, really, go. 